Welcome to Defeat Your Cravings, hosted by Dr. Glenn Livingston, Ph.D. Dr. Glenn is a clinical psychologist and former multi-million dollar consultant to the big food industry and uses his experience to help you defeat your cravings. This show will help you to focus on dramatically reducing cravings and leaving the diet mentality behind so you can more easily and effortlessly achieve your health, fitness, and body composition goals. Please remember, no doctor-patient relationship is created via this show, and you are responsible for confirming any changes to your diet, health, or psychological routines with an appropriately licensed professional before implementing them. Before we get started, if you haven't downloaded the free smartphone app to access dozens of these recordings all in one place, as well as to avail yourself of a confidential community for support, motivation, and assistance, please visit the podcast link on DefeatYourCravings.com as soon as possible. And now, here's your host, Dr. Glenn Livingston. I'm here with a kind-hearted woman named Anna, who's agreed to share this time with you so that you can benefit from her experience and strength and hope and wisdom, as well as her trials and tribulations and stumbles and falls. How are you, Anna? I'm wonderful. Thanks, Glenn. I know you for a couple of years now, don't I? I don't think it's a couple yet, but it feels like it because of the nature of how we work together. Yes, and we've had a lot of interaction, and it's been, I think, valuable on, on all sides. At least it has for me. It has for me. Maybe you can give people just a little bit of background about you and food in general, and in more particularly what you want to talk about today, and then we'll work on whatever you want to work on. Okay. I have a relationship with food, <laughs> and I didn't really understand how out of control with food I was until I started exploring things about rules for food and these types of things. I have in the past let food control me. I've thought about food, been obsessed with food. My weight has yo-yoed, and I suppose you have to do some kind of diet to do that. And I've had some health challenges as a result of life. I have celiacs. I've always thought that food and my mood were connected. So I've experimented with food for most of my life with some success, but it was more that the experiments were to keep me in check and my behavior in check. And I never felt really at ease with food. Hmm. Okay. Oh, and then what happened? So over the years, I understood a little bit more about mind body, how things were connected, how my thoughts were connected to how I did things and my behaviors. It didn't control my ability to eat a gallon of ice cream or a cake for dinner or things like this. So that's part of what happened until I started exploring uh, your work and the program that I've done with you and the programs I've done with you. And what was it about my work that resonated with you and helped? The primary thing was being able to separate myself and my identity from choices I was making about food from this internal voice. It made excuses for things I was doing. This internal voice was telling me it was okay to do things and I could behave in certain ways that just I would agree with. And then I would be back to feeling depressed and sad. So your work gave me a way to address that and to really be clear about that in my mind, to give me choices and control over my life and my food and my situations. It's grown exponentially from there. My comfort in life, my ability to be in life and enjoy it and be energized. Does my heart good, Anna. And it sounds like primarily it was being given the permission to separate your constructor versus destructive thoughts about food and a very specific set of instructions to do that. It sounds like that's what really helped you. Do you want to give an example or two and then we can talk about whatever you want to work on? Well, we can even talk about alcohol or dairy or food groups, but it's the idea that I would go out and decide, ooh, okay, I can do this. I can consume this food or drink knowing that it was going to have an effect the next day or for the next few days. And somehow like a taste would lead to more tastes and would lead to a cup or a plate. And I gave myself these permissions like, oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. You can handle it to the extent where I would then indulge in things and thinking that this was joy it was temporarily, but then I suffered the consequences. And so it was extremely destructive and went against my goals, went against my thoughts and feelings. And I knew that I could do it with some things. Like I had given up coffee. So I knew the possibility existed, but I didn't know how to translate that so I could control that. 
So like I hadn't had coffee for 20 years when I started this program, but I didn't know how to give up dairy. And then I figured that out. And, and a whole food group, I was able to give up. I don't want it in moderation. And other things I eat in moderation now. So I'm a lot more discerning and capable of doing this. It's up to you. 100% up to me. But that doesn't mean that I can do it all the time. It doesn't mean I don't need help doing it. I, and I certainly need practice. I don't need others' input, but to have other inputs accelerates my learning, so to say. Mm-hmm. You don't need to be part of a team. You want to be part of a team. Exactly. It's like the concept of interdependence as opposed to independence. Yes. Um, there's another level. You don't need me. You can eat well without me, but I could help you do it faster and better if you want to. And the more specific I can ask my questions, the easier and quicker it becomes. So ask me questions. What can I help you with? It's interesting because I know that I can stress eat and want to numb out in these things, these words. And I've been aware of that for a long time. So I know I don't want that. What I'm experiencing now is some little mini binges. And a mini binge for me might be eating foods that I don't usually have in my diet, like processed foods such as gluten-free bread or a slice of cake or eating fruit after a certain hour. And so I'm finding myself doing this and I'm calling them mini binges. It's bothering me because I get off track. I want to say I lose momentum. I stay in a holding pattern that I don't want to be in anymore. So that's one major thing. It's kind of a question. Can we address that? And I also have another question and I'm wondering if it's part of the same and by addressing one, it would domino effect on the other. The other is, I say, I'm just going to eat the one bowl of food, and then I eat it, and I want something else. And recently, I was in a community environment, meaning we all were served food, and we all ate at the same time. And I noticed that other people would take a plate of food, and they wouldn't go back for seconds. And if there was a dessert or a snack during the day, they would only take one piece. And I was so conflicted because I wanted more at the meal or I was nervous and scared that it wasn't going to be enough or I managed to get an extra piece of cake or something, whatever the snack was. And others didn't seem to seek that. And I felt like I was almost hiding food again. And I don't understand that when there is enough. Okay, let's investigate that. So you said gluten-free bread fruit after a certain hour, and what else is a mini binge that you're having? It could be like a slice of home baking that someone makes. What are the rules that you have that would make that into a mini binge? I have a rule about fruit that I don't eat fruit after 4 p.m. I have a rule about not eating any processed food, and I have tried a rule about no sugar. So there are things that I'm keeping in there is that I eat gluten-free. So the bread and the cake would have been gluten-free. I think I said enough. Do you have a rule that says that you never eat sugar or do you not have a rule that says you don't have sugar? I don't have white sugar in my house. I don't cook with it. I don't seek it. I never put it in anything. But I'm aware that it is in baked goods when someone hands it to me. I do have a rule that says... I don't eat lollies, candy, manufactured chocolates. I can eat cocoa. The only sugars or sweet foods that I eat are pure stevia and pure monk fruit and a teaspoon of honey in a lemon and honey tea, no more than one a day. And you said you can have whole fruit also, right? Correct. I soak dried fruit, so yeah. So you have a rule. This is the only sweet taste you can have are monk fruit. I forgot the other one. Stevia. And whole fruit and whole fruit and stevia. Okay. And so a slice of cake would be breaking that rule? Correct. What's the rule that you have that would prevent you from having gluten-free bread? Uh, It's processed. Okay. So no processed food that includes bread? Correct. Does it include all bread? Yeah. What about pasta or other types of flours? I don't eat that because I'm gluten-free and I don't substitute it. The one exception I have is for some keto gluten-free rolls. Okay. And you consider that to not be processed food? No, I consider it an exception to the processed food rule. Okay, so no processed food except for keto rolls. Yeah. Okay, so you do have a very specific target, and you're breaking it with a gluten-free bread, and you're breaking it with fruit after a certain hour, and sometimes a slice of something when you're at an event, and you're also feeling perturbed that it's difficult for you to feel satisfied with a reasonable amount of food. 
Correct. And it's not just perturbed. It's almost fearful and scared. Okay. The goal would be with regards to the one plate would be to have one plate and let it be enough at an event, at a social event? Any time. At my own house, at an event. Okay. Yes. Would you like to have a rule that says you can have only one plate of food so that you'll bring all of the thoughts that suggest that that's scary, frightening, you really need more? Would you like to have a rule that says that so that you bring them all into focus and can study them? Or does that feel like too much for you? I didn't understand so that I can have only one plate of food. Well, you don't have a rule that says you can only have one plate of food now, that you told me anyway. Correct. You're observing that you'd like to feel settled with one plate of food. And so I was wondering if you wanted to make it a rule, because when you make something a rule, then all of the thoughts in your head which try to justify breaking it come into focus and you can study them. Yes, I would like that. And I like to say that I would be settled with one plate of food. I'll never eat more than one plate of food at a meal again. Okay. And the goal is to teach yourself to feel settled, but feelings are not part of rules. The reason for that is that feelings are ambiguous by nature, and you can't always objectively determine whether you have this feeling or that feeling. I mean, it's a good thing to try to do. And so it creates wiggle room for the pig. And so we'll say, I'll never have more than one plate of food again. And then you can say, well, isn't it interesting? The pig seems to be saying, I should have more than one plate of food because I feel too anxious or I'm going to starve, or I don't know exactly what your pig is going to say. Okay. Yeah, there won't be enough, or I don't know when the next meal is coming, or those things. What would it mean to you to be able to have just one plate of food, regardless of how you felt, to stick to your no processed foods rules indefinitely, and to stick to your fruit rule and stop having fruit after 4 p.m.? What would it mean to you to do that for the rest of the year, for example? It's about six months. It would be amazing to feel that I've nourished my body but not overtaxed it. So like it's like kind of giving my body a chance. It's like a certain kind of freedom for me. Say more about it. It's just got this quality to me of flow and energy. If I could relax and have up to one plate of nourishing food per meal, and like that's like three meals a day that were up to a whole plate of nourishing food, and my body didn't have to recover, like it could use that energy. And then when that was like used up, I could fill it with more of this nourishing food. It's like, that just sounds exciting and joyful to me and steady and, and reliable. And yeah. One of the best things a food mentor ever said to me was that you should never have to recover from a meal. Why would we be designed to have to recover from a meal? In the wild, it would have put us in danger of being vulnerable to predators, and why should we have to recover? It doesn't make sense. What else would it mean to you to stick to these rules 100% and eliminate the mini binges and the extra food beyond the one plate? It would mean a certain freedom for me because I keep seeing myself being in distress. So I guess it would be the opposite of distress. It would be ease around food. It would be joy around food. It would be a certain kind of knowingness around food. It would create like presence, presence, because I wouldn't be stressed about the future. I wouldn't be stressed about things. I would just be present. You'd have a confident presence. Yeah, it's like discretion. It's like I could use my discretion. Like there are certain things like I don't smoke. I wouldn't put that in my body. And I'm not in conflict about that. I don't hang out with smokers. In old days, I might stand outside, but I don't do that anymore because it doesn't suit me. So it would sort of bring on this whole other, I want to say thing, but it would, it just would change my associations, I hope. So it would become easier and easier. You'd have an identity as someone who was comfortable and confident with one plate of food, and you weren't obsessed about it, and you would just move forward with your life. Yeah, it's comfortable and confident. It's a non-issue. They just know that I just don't do that. Okay. On the other hand, if you let the pig run the show and you didn't address this, you let the mini midges go on and you let going beyond a plate of food, I'm not saying that has to be the rule for the rest of your life, but if you let that fear run you for the rest of your life, what would happen as the years went by? For me, I would feel stagnant, always wanting in life more than I think I've been dealt. 
it would create like food obsession. So it would always be this energy being spent, this obsessive energy, and there would be recovery. Instead of saying, hey, I want to nurture myself and enjoy some time alone, it would be, I need to numb myself out and I deserve this. And there would be these fake rewards all the time. But I think as I'm getting older, it would have an effect on my well-being, my health. It would spike my blood sugars and all these things we know about. It puts me in line for diabetes and weight gain. And then I also know that when I'm in those phases, I don't want to move my body. So it would limit me and isolate me. And it wouldn't be nice. It would like tell me that I limit myself and I would put myself down. So do you want to commit to this? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I do. And, and it's scary. And and I, and I want to feel that sense of fluidity and joy. It's going to be a very curious time. There are no food police that are going to come and put you in jail if you make a mistake along the way. But by having a really clear bullseye and aiming at it you know, with perfection with your soul, then you'll have the opportunity to observe what happens when you miss and what caused you to miss. You want to do that? Definitely. So why does the pig say that you shouldn't or you can't or you won't be able to do this? It says it's way too scary. One of the pig's favorite phrases for the mini binges is, it's okay, you'll catch up some other time. I think with the mini binges, it's like, it's okay, you've been good for a long time, your body's pretty clean, it can handle this. Your body can absorb this crap you're putting into it. It's, oh, you know how to recover now, or you'll just eat more greens tomorrow. And But it's this constant, it's okay, you can handle it. And so it's kind of like, it gives me a taste of the space, and then it takes it away, fills the gap. It treats your body and your health like a big garbage can, and as soon as it's empty, it wants to fill it up with more junk again? Yeah, that's really accurate. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just described that, and that's exactly what it is. Does your pig say anything else? Why else does your pig say that you shouldn't do this or you can't or won't be able to? So with regards to the one plate of food, this is really scary. It's a lot around you can't trust that there's always going to be food on the table. Then it goes into my finances. It goes into you might not be able to afford this later, so you should eat it now. So things like that. And and when I'm very cashless, it's a lot easier to spread it out. (laughs) But when I want the feeling of abundance, it then tells me to eat it all. The pig says, you know, eat this all now. You'll be able to get more later. Very creative. Okay. These are very important issues to talk about. Okay. Anything else? Uh, Right now, that's what's coming up. So it's interesting because it's exhausting talking about this. I know. I know. You're doing a great job. I know. This taps into some of our most primitive fears. You know, the simplistic answer is that you probably have had some experiences where there genuinely wasn't enough. And so you're feeling echoes of those nightmares. There probably wasn't enough. And it was probably when you were smaller than you can remember, maybe before you could talk. And so there is a genuine fear of starvation. It's not rational. I think you're very capable of feeding yourself. And what are you, 40 years old? So you've managed to navigate life for... You're very you, generous. So you're a little older? Okay. I'm all about your age, yes. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. So you've managed to navigate yourself for a very long time, and you haven't starved yet, so it's probably not rational, but it feels rational at those times. So the pig says it's way too scary. It's way too scary to have just one plate of food. Can you fill in the rest of that argument? It's way too scary. What's going to happen? It's way too scary to have one plate of food. You'll run out of energy. You'll embarrass yourself because you'll run out of energy. And you won't be able to contribute the way others contribute. In fact, you'll run out of energy and you'll have to recover from running out of energy. Is that true if you have one plate of food? No, it's not true. It's not related to me running out of energy. I have run out of energy, and before I was diagnosed with celiacs, I would lose energy from certain activities, but it wasn't because I was famished. 
you've never starved the energy out of you before. You've not gotten to that point. Correct. <laughs> and certainly not by just having a full plate of nourishing food. Also being able to have a full plate of nourishing food three to five hours later. It's a very important thing you told yourself, yes. There's another meal around the corner. That's something you can tell yourself when you feel scared. There's another meal coming right around the corner. Is it possible that by having more than one plate of food that you'll run out of energy, that that could take energy from you? Yeah, yeah, for sure, because it takes more time to digest it. It zaps your energy. Yes. It's also more likely to ferment in your system if you overeat. You don't get the same nourishment out of food that you overeat than when you're eating just the right amount for you. And I'm assuming you know what to put on the plate that will make it the right amount. I'm assuming that you intellectually know that. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. It's actually the opposite of what the pig is saying. Correct. The pig says that it's okay. You've been eating clean for a while. You know how to recover and your body can absorb a little poison. I think you said crap. Your body can absorb that. Yeah. Is that true? Um, I'll say yes, but if you put poison into your system, you still are putting poison into your system. And so you might feel full on poison, but is that good for you? No, it's not. The thing about sugar that I know is there's no nutrition in sugar and our body doesn't need it because our body can produce glucose. So it only gives harm to the body. I know that I shouldn't have to fill a void. So the question is, is it true that if I put crap in when it's empty, I, I think it's worse actually now that I'm thinking about it it's not true that it's okay because it's even worse because my body will absorb it. It will think that it, my body will use it in a way that it's not good for me. And it'll be a faster metabolism of crap. There's no buffer. It's worse. It's more dangerous. Interesting. That's really interesting. Also occurs to me, I don't know about you, but I don't want the purpose of my life to be to prove how much poison I can pass through my system without dying. I don't want the purpose of my life to be to prove how much poison I can recover from. If we all only get a certain amount of energy and vibrancy to spend in our life, I want to make the most of the energy and vibrancy that I have. I don't want to waste it on trying to you know, be a real man and recover from poison, right? I don't need to do that. And I also know it's a cumulative thing. Like it's going to catch up to me. It ruins the digestion instead of improves it. And I want to improve things as I go. Yes, and, and it stymies your progress. To the extent that eating clean allows your body to rid itself of poison, it interferes with that process. At minimum, it takes a few days away from that. So your body won't be able to continue to detoxify and do the healing that it might need to do from the earlier years that you damaged it. It's interesting because when people talk about smoking, they do this thing about if you smoke that, it's going to shorten your life at the other end. But I've never done that with what we're talking about now. And it kind of is like that. It's kind of like it's just going to shorten the quality at the end, whereas I want to have great quality on my last day. You know. I was listening to Dr. Furman. I forgot the name of the book that he said this in. And he said that you pay for those indulgences in three ways. You pay now by the time that it takes you to recover. Um, so for usually 24 to 72 hours, you feel pretty crappy. You lose those days or at least half of your vitality for those days as you're recovering. You pay later in life with disabilities and aches and pains and suffering. And then you pay by losing years at the end of your life. That had a profound impact on me, actually. I never really thought about it like that. The pig would like to say you can get away with it. You'll be better in a couple of days, but you're not really getting away with it. Also, Anna, I think that our ability to recover gets worse and worse as we, we age. For example, I know that the pancreas gets worse at managing the insulin pump as the years go by. Like I can remember when I was a kid, I would have six Pop-Tarts every morning for breakfast and I was fine. <laughs> like I was really not. If I had one Pop-Tart for breakfast now, I would feel horrible. I would feel awful. Your body loses the capacity to process that as you, as you get older. So your pig says you'll, you can just eat more greens tomorrow to make up for it. What's the problem with that line of thinking? Um, again, it actually puts more stress on the digestive system. And if I go to finances, it costs more. 
but it's more stress and it's that compulsive thinking. It takes me away from the present. It's like a style of rewarding that's false. Like it's a false reward. The idea is not to eat. Well, if I, I don't know if I could eat twice the amount of greens that I already eat, but again, it taxes the digestive system. Yeah. So I think that's, it's false logic. It's false logic and false economy. The other problem is that the idea that you can make up for it tomorrow, first of all, it usually requires over restriction. So it puts you into this feast and famine cycle where you're really good one day and really bad the next day. And that's what the diet mentality is about, as opposed to eating healthy day in and day out with some loosening of the rules here and there, very consciously and purposely, so that you can have the treats that you want to. And some people choose never to do that. But it's not the diet mentality when you're very specific about what you're doing and you're planning to follow these rules. You're looking for a way of life. Research suggests that the more that people believe they can make up for it tomorrow, the worse of an eating problem that they have. This idea that there's some cleaning crew coming to fix things the next day, it really makes things worse. I don't know about you, but I don't really want to get away with anything. I want to live an addiction-free life. I want to live a clean, confident life with food where I let food nourish and energize me and I feel healthy and strong and present and able to walk through my days with pride and energy. I don't want to get away with anything. It seems like a child's game to me. I don't want to get away with it. That's what helped me get over that particular squeal. Thank you. Because yeah, I like being really transparent and being really like a woman of my word. I don't like supporting the manufacturers. I'm going to state that sugar can create an inability to think clearly. And there's a lot of problem when you can't think clearly. There's a movie by Ken Burns about the life and times of Harvey Milk and someone consumed too many Twinkies and how he handled things because of that. He assassinated somebody. And I looked at that and I thought, I don't want to be part of that. I don't want to support that. I don't want to be part of that. I don't want that in my body. So when I allow myself, I feel disconnected and I don't want to be disconnected from life. Very good. That's a very profound insight. I've quoted this before with you, so forgive me, but I don't think the audience has heard it. Chicardo Krishnamurti, I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly, Mm -hmm. he said it's no measure of health to be well-adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And we live in a world where the bulk of commerce is directed at slowly killing us with food and having us laugh it off. You know, you don't have to contribute to that. You can opt out. Yeah. And I like opting out. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's a better life. The last thing you said that we, two more things you said, you can't trust that the food will always be available, so you have to eat as much as you can now. What's the problem with that line of thinking? Well, I want to say nothing, but um, if I look at it almost philosophically or spiritually, it takes away my drive to forage or succeed or, or, you know, to believe that I have to stockpile is the only way. It deadens me down. It lessens me sort of my ability to know and to rest in the now and to trust. Like my body is not the place I stockpile. I'm not like a chipmunk putting nuts in my cheeks and then, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and like they do say that you need water, not food, if you're in a survival situation. And it's just an interesting thing. Of It's like a budget, you know, your, your money grows when you can budget it and you can choose how you spend it and you can control it. And so in a way it's similar with food. And and I love preserving food if I can, if I can keep it on the shelf, but I like foraging for food. I, I like quality of food. And again, to tax my digestive system by eating everything in sight, it's a false economy. It's not the health that I want. It disables me rather than enables me. Anna, would you consider... When your pig says that you can't trust that food's always going to be available, would you consider reframing that and saying, well, I couldn't trust that food was always going to be available, but now I'm a person with skills for foraging and feeding myself. And, you know, I'm a lovable person. People like me. People will feed me if I need them to. I can figure that out. I couldn't trust, but I can trust now. Would you consider that? Yeah, I would consider that. It's interesting as you're talking, because the other thing is, People used to feed me food that I didn't want and didn't like, and I accepted it and ate it because maybe I was traveling or that's what was offered and I didn't want to offend people. I don't do that anymore. So if I cannot do that anymore when food is being offered, I can say, no, thank you. I certainly can say, 
no thank you to amounts of food. Very good. You won't be able to afford this later. You should do it all now and you, maybe you'll get more later. You can wrap things up and take it with you and, and eat it at your next meal and things like that. There you go. Okay. Now I'm asking you, how confident are you that you could maintain this one plate of food rule? Not that you're confident that it's going to feel great. But how confident are you that you can do this for a month or so? I feel confident that I could do it. The pig started screaming, oh, that's okay, because we'll get you in between meals, you know, or we'll get you in the nighttime. And um, that's what I get. Do you have a rule that there's no eating between meals? I have a rule that I can eat vegetables in between meals. Oh, is the pig going to get you to have too many vegetables between meals? I don't think so. I don't think I could overeat cauliflower. So what if you just say that's okay for now? You can have cauliflower between meals or vegetables between meals. What if you decide to work on that later if that's something you want to do or not at all? So can the pig get you between meals? No. Again, it's, you know, I can't overeat fruit or, or vegetables. No, I can't. Do you struggle with nighttime eating syndrome? Do you eat in the middle of the night and wake up with cookies on your pillow? No, I don't do that. Although the, one of the recent things I was doing is I was eating after seven o'clock and I never used to do that. So that was part of the mini binges, you know, eating bananas or something and then at night. And I didn't used to do that or snacking after dinner or starting to eat later. And that's new for me, but I think I can put that down. And if you allow yourself to have these feelings, the fear of not having enough, the fear that there's not going to be food there later, if you allow yourself to have those feelings and you don't eat at night and you just kind of follow your rules, pay careful attention. Give yourself an opportunity to journal or think about or meditate on it. You're going to process these feelings and you're going to reconcile it with reality. When you have the extra food, no judgment for me if that happens, but I just want you to know, if you have the extra food, then you wind up reinforcing the idea that these fears are real. It goes on almost indefinitely. So I think that you had the idea that there's something wrong that you feel like this. And I, I think it's natural that you feel like this. I think there are, are good reasons that you feel like this. And so I think if you wait until it feels right, it's never going to happen. But if you do this, if you adhere to these rules and you just observe the feelings and write them down and figure out what the pig's saying and refute it, then I think you'll take a step up. I think that the feelings will dissipate over time. Just like you don't hang out with smokers, you're not going to have to hang out with extra plate eating Anna. You're not going to have to do that anymore. You'll change your identity like that. I love that. Thank you. Do you have any questions or concerns? No, that was really the concern. And, and, and I love now I'm curious, you know, now I'm curious about, huh, three plates of food a day and the vegetables and fruit in between if I want something and noticing if the feelings come up, but also smiling, knowing that I'm, I'm experimenting, I'm trying something new, I'm aiming differently now. And uh, that's going to take me a little bit of time to adjust to it. I'll be all the wiser and experienced in a month, in two months, in a year. Exactly. Exactly. That's just the right attitude that I was looking for. It's terrific. And that brings us to the end of today's broadcast of Defeat Your Cravings, hosted by Dr. Glenn Livingston. If you'd like to find out more about the products and services Dr. Glenn offers to help you dramatically reduce your cravings and stop overeating in 90 days or less, please visit DefeatYourCravingsCoaching.com. That's DefeatYourCravingsCoaching.com. Thanks.